The Ouya might be the most notorious failure of any video game Kickstarter. The micro console kicked off a war of competing systems like the Mad Cat's Mojo, Nvidia Shield, and Nexus Player. It was a war nobody would win, as these consoles all had one flaw, which was supposed to be their main selling point, the ability to play mobile phone games on your TV. In a stunning plot twist, it turns out that's not something anybody wants to do. But among the casualties of this silly battle under a tangle of bad games and broken promises lies the biggest failure of them all. Nobody remembers it, if they ever knew it existed in the first place. Its story is eerily similar to that of the Ouya's. It was also successfully funded on Kickstarter, it grabbed headlines when it debuted, it pitched itself on its ability to play mobile games on a TV, and it ran an Android operating system. Yet this console possessed what should have been an ace up its sleeve, a trailblazing, cult-hit game developer and publisher running the show. How did it go so wrong? This is the story of Play Jam's GameStick, and why its failure makes even the Ouya look good in comparison. Created as a subsidiary of visual media company Static 2358, 2358, 2358, 235. In 1999, founder Jasper Smith had big ideas. Smith, according to his LinkedIn page, helps produce financial rock stars one hashtag build wealth plan at a time. But that isn't the Jasper Smith we're talking about today. Our Jasper Smith had previously created a bunch of media companies like the Fantastic Corporation and Optimistic Entertainment. Now at Play Jam, he had artists and programmers at Static design video games that could be streamed and played on set-top boxes for TVs. Play Jam quickly found a market in the UK and France through Sky and ITV, becoming one of the first interactive TV experiences ever. If you grew up watching Jetix on Toon Disney and ABC Family here in the US back in the early to mid 2000s, you may be familiar with some of their work. These games were... primitive, to say the least. But considering these games were streamed over the internet on TVs in the early 2000s, this was ahead of its time. For context, Netflix wouldn't start streaming movies until 2007. And there was a big marketing campaign back in the day for the service too, with crude TV commercials, Meta. Okay, my destiny. Very popular with young couples like yourselves. And, if you like it, our chap Casper could assist you with colour-coordinated tiles. Oh, and what's more, by now, I'll toss in the B-Day. You can't get away with either of those today. Cartoons. <laughs> and stuff that was just weird. I fell down a rabbit hole for half an hour looking at a bunch of old commercials in case you couldn't tell. Smith later sold Static and Play Jam in 2001 to a company called OpenTV for $68 million. That's about $99.3 million today calculated for inflation. As far as I can tell, OpenTV more or less folded Play Jam into themselves, but what exactly they did, I don't know. It's hard to find information on a company with as generic a name as OpenTV. It doesn't matter though, because Play Jam was sold again in 2008 to a tech industry veteran who wanted to get in on this whole interactive TV business. A guy named Jasper Smith. No, no, still not that one. Yeah, he bought his own company back from the people he sold it to for an undisclosed sum. Not long after, Smith and an employee of his came up with a new idea. A new product from the team at Playjamp have squeezed an Android-powered console into a three-inch stick that plugs directly into your TV. So, Play Jam as a company has really been focused for the last two years on building its presence on smart TVs. But about 12 months ago, we realized that one of the difficulties of bringing games to smart TVs is that you're dealing with lots of different manufacturers. You're dealing with different hardware, different software, different screen resolutions, all that sort of thing. So we wondered, what if we actually owned the hardware platform as well? Then we'd be able to control a much more pure end-to-end -end user experience. That quote comes from Anthony Johnson, 
speaking to Metro UK. Who's Anthony Johnson? He would be a former basketball player from my hometown of Charleston, South Carolina, who played for 87 teams in the NBA. That's not our Anthony Johnson, however. Our Anthony Johnson was, at the time, CCO of Play Jam. He's also the one who came up with the idea in 2012 for what would become the Game Stick. From the start, they knew they wanted to hit a few features. They wanted the system to be small and easily transportable, they wanted it to run Android to make it easy to port games over to, and they wanted to continue to stream and sell games online using the platform their company was built on. Or if you want to hear the marketing buzz version, Game Stick enables us to add a further route to TV by leveraging the Android operating system to bring existing titles to the service as well as providing a platform that we hope will inspire a new generation of affordable games for TV. That's again from Johnson in a riveting interview with Review Fix. After a year of work planning the console, designing it and the controller, the UI, and soaring distribution, everything was ready. Except there was one slight problem. That's right, they left the oven on. Oh no, they didn't have enough money. So like everyone else in 2012, they decided to turn the oven off. No, no, they went to Kickstarter, right. The GameStick's crowdfunding campaign began on January 2nd, 2013. To market its launch, Playjam continued its weird advertising tradition with a video showing a controller getting tested. <laughs> A woman with drumsticks sitting on the floor, and another video showing a five-year-old unboxing the final version, which I'm not going to show because I don't want YouTube nuking my channel from orbit. Even without the weird ads, it got coverage from sites like The Guardian, Engadget, Eurogamer, and Man's Gear, which apparently isn't a sex shop. But we'll come back to these later, not Man's Gear. The killer app of the game stick was its small size. People are always on the go, the Kickstarter page says. Traditional consoles are big. We set out to create a big screen games console that was so small you could pop it into your pocket. It's tiny. So small, in fact, that GameStick fits inside its own controller so you can take all your games with you to any TV you like anywhere. Simply plug it into an HDMI slot, grab the controller, and play away. You can kind of see why people were lured in, just like they were with the Ouya. The Kickstarter page looks professional with all these flashy pictures of the prototype controller and videos showing it off. There's walls of text talking about how great it's going to be and why it totally won't fail within a year. Developers were apparently lining up to put their games on this thing. It was going to change the industry and you could play mobile games on your TV. Heck, you could play regular games on it too, like R-Type, Another World, and, uh, well, others eventually, maybe, but you could fit it in your pocket. How cool is that? At the time, the idea of playing mobile games on your TV was a good one. Remember, this was 2013. Sure, microtransactions had been around for a while at that point, and they've become synonymous with mobile gaming now, but there was still something novel about being able to play full console games on your phone. And many of them were quite good back then. Shadowgun, Fist of Awesome, Riptide GP, The Button Affair, these were all great phone games that you could now play on this unit right out of the box. None of them had microtransactions, timers, or secretly sent your data to Google or the government or God knows where else. Except there was one tiny flaw. With its focus on mobile games, coupled with PlayJam pushing the portability aspect, well, you can see the problem, right? I can already play all of these games on the go. This feels like little more than a glorified PS1 LCD attachment screen. Still, those cheap things were popular. The beauty of the games industry is that if you achieve scale, the profits that you can generate from games are, is very significant. The game stick met with similar success to the Ouya. It blew past its optimistic $100,000 goal in a day and a half on its way to earning $647,658 by the campaign's end on February 1st. Obviously, that doesn't hold a candle to the Ouya's $8.6 million, but for a console that does the same things as the Ouya, which by that point was on the verge of shipping, supposedly, it's a pretty spectacular sum. During the campaign, the game stick got pretty lukewarm coverage from publications. Most of the articles from places proudly displayed on the Kickstarter page don't have much to say about the game stick other than, hey, this thing exists. Trust me, I've worked at gaming websites in the past, and these are all, it's a slow news day, let's write about this thing that might be popular since it's like that other thing that was popular articles, if I've ever seen them. Though I do like this line from the Guardian's whopping 150 word article that says, after mentioning the game stick is made by Playjam, that if you've actually played games on your Skybox, however, that might not sound a particularly enticing prospect. 
The biggest update came on January 29th. Jasper Smith weighed in for the first time, or perhaps a PR person wrote a statement and put his name on it, saying, We've also signed up hundreds of indies to our developer program, as well as a number of larger developer houses such as Relentless, Dot Emu, Madfinger, and Hutch, plus many more that we are actively negotiating with. I know it does not feel like it, but it's only been 29 days, so bear with updates on this. Smith also says they read over 8,000 emails, many of them offering constructive feedback, which prompted Playjam to change the design of the controller. Rather than the flat NES-style plastic square they've been showing off, they were now going with one featuring palm grips, higher-sitting rubberized thumbsticks, standard XYBA buttons, and a rubberized finish on the bottom, and a polished top deck. Mmm, sexy. The rest of the updates on Kickstarter during the campaign are nothing special, so let's shift gears to the Ouya real quick. If you saw my video on it, you know the Ouya went down in a ball of flames fairly quickly. It launched in June 2013, months late, and even then it went out to stores before the Kickstarter backers and pre-orderers got theirs. We don't have sales figures for the console itself, but we do have numbers for games. After a month, Ouya's best reviewed game, and one that would become a hit on PC, Towerfall, only sold 2,000 copies. And would sell 7,000 in the system's lifetime. Hidden in Plain Sight only sold 1,900 copies, while free-to-play RPG Nimble Quest sold only 122 in-game purchases. Within a year, Boxer 8, later named Ouya Inc., was on the verge of bankruptcy. They ended up selling out to Razer, who discontinued the console in 2015, and the Ouya online service in 2019. Knowing that, how little money the game stick had compared to Ouya, and how quickly the mobile gaming market fell into the gutter after they bought a 9.99 starter pack to skip the timer, how do you think things went for Play Jam? Unfortunately, I have to give this verdict a don't buy. For $80, you can actually use that for iOS games on your tablet. Even for Android, there's probably more games that you could get on Google Play than you would on the game stick. Basic narrative writing suggests this is where I should mention when things go south for the company. The obstacles our heroes eventually overcomes, a mere poire of destructive ingredients that make this a foul brew indeed. But that point never came for the game stick, because there was never really a high point to start with. Sure, it raised a bunch of money on Kickstarter, and you can use that as a barometer if you want, but other than that, there's really nothing to say one way or the other about this project. The game stick eventually launched after a delay in November 2013, and nobody seems to have cared. No one reported on sales, new games throughout its life, the difficulties Playjam were having like they had done with the Ouya. Perhaps publications were afraid of repeating themselves, or were already moving on to the next big thing. There were a handful of reviews at launch, though. One from Tech Radar is apathetic, giving it two and a half stars, which seems rather generous after reading the actual review. Eurogamer said the game stick is already running on outdated architecture when it released, that its games weren't very good, and that it's almost impossible to see the justification in spending 80 pounds on a piece of hardware which plays more expensive versions of games you can already download on your existing phone or tablet. And then there's this particularly brutal line from The Verge. I never thought I'd say this about one of our lowest scored products ever, but seriously, if you're not 100% sold on the game stick's form factor, spend the extra $20 and get an Ouya. <laughs> More like ouch ya. Sometime in 2016, less than three years after launch, Playjam announced the online store would be discontinued the following year. Since the game stick was a closed system, meaning games and other software couldn't be loaded onto it without buying them from the online store, this meant the game stick was effectively dead. The game stick website, which is now down and flagged as a virus risk in Firefox, displayed a goodbye message from sometime in 2016 until it went down in 2019. Pulling it up on the Wayback Machine reveals the original formatting broken, but the message still readable. It says, in part, Dear Game Sticker. Well, that sounds vaguely offensive. As hardware capability continues to evolve at a rapid pace, Playjam has been busy working on white label solutions for the operator industry and will be launching app stores on compatible hardware providing access to games, video, and home automation services globally from Q1 next year, 2017. We massively appreciate the support of our original Kickstarter backers and subsequent retail customers and hope to be accessible once again through our evolving partnership soon. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why did you just jump to the game stick dying like that? What happened after it launched? Well, I did that because, as far as I can tell, nothing happened. Between the game stick launching in November 2013 and Playjam announcing the service would be discontinued in 2016, I couldn't find a rootin' tootin' thing about the game stick. Not a single article, YouTube video, review, blog post, nothing. I can't even find out when in 2016 this announcement was made. It's as if this thing never even existed.
We were really frustrated by the TV gaming space. It was really clunky, it was big consoles, big controllers, wires everywhere. So we wanted to blow that apart with a really beautiful product. With hindsight, it's not hard to see why the game stick failed. It was underpowered, so the games made for it had to be limited. Not that it mattered anyway, considering the state of mobile gaming by the time this thing came out. And as far as I can tell, there are no games made specifically for the game stick. Speaking of which, it turns out no one actually wants to play games designed for mobile devices on a big TV. And if there was one worth playing, it'd probably get ported to PC or consoles anyway. Despite PlayJam's let's call it rich advertising history, the game stick failed to capitalize on whatever press surrounding the Kickstarter campaign there was. Do you know anyone who even heard of this thing, let alone owned one? Because I don't, and I know like five people. And if they did know about it, they probably wouldn't have spent $80 for what looked like a cheap hunk of plastic that could play games they already had on the tiny supercomputer they carried around on their belts to look cool. But above all, the game stick just didn't have any good games. Despite running Android, there was no way to get the Google Play Store on it. It had its own proprietary storefront. PlayJam didn't make their own games for the unit, so they had to rely on other developers agreeing to publish it there, and why would they? Pay this random company a fee to host your game and get maybe a 70% cut from a handful of sales? No thanks. And let's not forget PlayJam themselves. They did not have the money to do this. Yes, they sold for 80 million or however much it was back in the day, and Jasper Smith bought them back for probably several million more, but if they had to rely on Kickstarter to fund this thing, then the $650,000 they got wouldn't have been enough. Unless, of course, they didn't actually need the Kickstarter money and were instead using it as an advertising service, which plenty of other companies have done. Regardless, even at the time, it's difficult to see the point of this or any other micro consoles. And this is coming from someone who pre-ordered the Ouya like an idiot. At least with that, we had the promise of developers making new games exclusively for the Ouya and the ability to play a free trial of every game on the store. The Ouya exclusives weren't that great and the free trial requirement for games was dropped rather quickly, but at least it was there at the start. What did the game stick ever have going for it? You could fit it in your pocket. Oh boy, talk about a revolution. Look out, Nintendo. You might have to deal with a lawsuit from PlayJam any day now. Not that you could fit the Switch in your pocket, but like it's a, it's a portable thing. Whatever, you, you get it. We've come a long way with this product and it's been a real labor of love, but we're really proud of what we've created that we think can be truly disruptive for the games industry. And we really hope that we'll find the support we need to take this product to the next level. You'd think after the abysmal failure of one console, PlayJam would throw in the towel on ever trying anything hardware related again, or at least for the immediate future, right? Wrong, you idiot. At some point, because again, there's very little press about this, PlayJam released another console. The PlayJam Portable Media Console is, this straight from PlayJam's website, a small media console designed to sit unobtrusively behind your TV when in use and is easily transported when traveling. Aimed at the family living room, the device is more than powerful enough to support AAA streaming and casual download games, as well as other rich media content. Golly, that sounds familiar. In fact, comparing the specs, you'll see the game stick and the portable media what's it are indeed quite similar. So did the game stick die just so they could effectively re-release it? It kind of looks that way, right? But the question of who's still at PlayJam, or if it even exists still, is more of a mystery. PlayJam's website still lists Jasper Smith and Anthony Johnson as part of the company, but I'm not sure either of them work there anymore. Anthony Johnson's LinkedIn page says he left in June 2017, eventually having the role of CEO within the company, despite PlayJam's website still listing him as CCO. Jasper Smith is, as always, founding, running, and chairing multiple companies, including Playworks Digital, Arkson Project, and Vala Capital. His LinkedIn page says he still works at PlayJam, but only as a chairman, not as a director, which the site lists. This other guy listed here, Barn Cleave, what a name, left PlayJam in 2019 according to his LinkedIn. Clicking the game link on their site takes you to a dead page, and their Twitter and Facebook pages haven't been updated since 2016. Also, look at the game's feature on their homepage, Prince of Persia The Shadow of Flame? That was ported to the iOS back in 2013. Raiden Legacy is from 2015, Ethan Meteor Hunter is from 2013, and what is that, an iPhone 5? If the company is dead, which I think it is, it went down quietly, just like the game stick. 
A fitting end, perhaps. Or maybe not. Remember, PlayJam started as a company making and selling games through TV apps in 1999, years before digital gaming storefronts or smart TVs were even a thing, and years before Netflix offered movie streams. They were ahead of their time, and their edgy TV ads played up to this fact. Ironically though, the game stick was anything but ahead of its time. It launched without enough financial or fan support, was built on a bad business model, lacked decent hardware, and good games. Sometimes companies with innovative new ideas are too far ahead of their time, sometimes they fail to live up to their own hype, and sometimes they don't press the interactive button on their telly remote and select Play Jam. What's most interesting about the game stick, I think, is just how uninteresting the whole thing was. I was about halfway through researching this video when I realized how boring the story is, but good old sunk cost fallacy kept me from scrapping it, hence the commercials, talk of ooyah, and even more dumb jokes than usual. Sorry, not sorry. See you next time, I hope.